Thank you, Arshna, ma'am, for all those kind words. And thank you, Dr. Bansi, though I can't see him in the hall, but thank you so much for inviting me here. And uh, the house is full, and the picture on the board is very well known to all of us, right? So this is the picture that comes to our mind when we talk of type 1. But the picture is changing. Now we have many faces of diabetes. We have celebrities with diabetes. We have young, old, middle-aged. We have with complication. We have highly uh, established bureaucrats, technocrats. Then at the same time, we have poor, very, very poor. And we have small babies. We have everything on our plate today. So we are talking of many faces of diabetes, that is heterogeneity of type 1 diabetes. So T1D is not monolithic. Then the question is, why? Why should we study heterogeneity? Dr. Meena just taught us it goes basal bolus, monitoring, and follow-up. So why do we need to understand the heterogeneity of type 1 diabetes? Let's see. So heterogeneity understanding will give you a personalized treatment. You can develop personalized treatment strategies and targeted interventions. You can also have improved disease management in terms of monitoring and support and risk stratification. Enhanced research insight. So you can have understanding of the pathophysiology and the environmental triggers. You will also have global health in implications, that is epidemiological insight. Then, as Madam said, the psychosocial factors. So that is why we are looking into heterogeneity. So what do we understand by the term heterogeneity? So it is pathogenetic heterogeneity, clinical heterogeneity, endotype heterogeneity, regional heterogeneity, socioeconomic heterogeneity, and finally we have the treatment heterogeneity. Coming one by one, so we are talking about pathogenetic heterogeneity. When we talk of pathogenetic heterogeneity, we talk about genetic factors, environmental triggers, and autoimmune response. So genetic heterogeneity, we talk about the various genetic markers, the role of HLA genes, and the other genetic factors. We all know that there is hardly a family history when we deal with our type 1 diabetes. Less than 85, more than 85% patients will come to you with no family history. So less than 5% will have a first degree relative, till we talk of genetics. In case of monozygotic twins, the incidence is around 6 to 8 percent, but whereas in case, sorry, in case of monozygotic twins, the incidence is around 30 to 50 percent, but whereas in case of dizygotic twins, the incidence comes down to 6 to 10 percent. And earlier the child is diagnosed, greater is the risk of a sibling developing type 1 diabetes. Then comes your HLA association. So, HLA DR3 and DR4, at least one locus will be present in 95% of the type 1 diabetes. The protective HLAs are HLA DR2, DR5, and HLA DQB1. So we have HLA heterogeneity at the same time. If you look at the curves, you will find that HLA class 2, the incidence decreases as the HLA class 2 varies. If you look at the another bar graph, the incidence is highest with DR3 and DR4 and less with DR3X and XX. Furthermore, to add to the research, we are studying genome-wide association and also we are studying transcription-wide association. So this genome-wide research will also affect the age of presentation of the child. Then comes your environmental triggers. This was the Teddy study, that is the, the epidemiological diabetes in young study and they have given us various factors beginning from your uh, in utero factors your enterovirus your rotavirus even covid-19 then you have vaccination then you have even milk or gluten has been implicated then various infections have been implicated so we have the environmental triggers then what about the same family same child same hla same environment Still one is having type 1, another is not having type 1. So we have some epigenetic bridges or we have epigenetic factors. They become the bridge between the environmental issues, environmental insults in the genetically at-risk children. So these children develop certain antibodies. Though Madam said, we don't do it routinely, we don't recommend it routinely, but I differ, I'm sorry. 
So antibody response happens, and we do it. So we have islet antibodies, islet antibodies, GAT65 is the most common, zinc H transporter, and then we have the insulin antibodies. Then depending upon the autoimmune response, as Madam said, a 49-year-old diagnosed with type 1, it is not surprising. Probably you do a GAT65 screening, and the latest study say, shows us that even a trace amount of GAT65 justifies introduction of insulin to your prescription. So there's a huge overlapping diabetes syndrome depending upon the autoimmune response to insulin resistance. We have the type 1, we have the LADA variants, we have the normal population, and we have the type 2 population. So depending upon the autoimmune response, the uh, type of diabetes can vary. Now look at the heterogeneity. If there is a first degree relative and you do a proband diagnostic study, you find antibody negative, rule out. Antibody positive with multiple antibodies, with multiple antibodies, less than 20 years, child will develop diabetes almost 90%. Above 20 years, less chances. If single antibody, there are chances of increasing seroconversion. And with increasing seroconversion, there is increased chances of developing type 1 diabetes. So a time to look back at a disease which is known to us since a century. So we have type 1 diabetes where we are losing beta cells. And the genetic predisposition began in utero. So the entire formatting was done in the womb. And this genetic predisposition, uh, predisposition does not change. The genetic format does not change. What changes is the development of antibodies or the immunity. And with the development of immunity and the environmental insult, there can be waxing and waning of the insulin secretion. And at times, the child might present quickly, or at times, the child may not present for the entire life. So there is a progression of the disease. Now coming to the clinical heterogeneity. When we talk of clinical heterogeneity, what do we really mean? We mean there is a huge variability in age of onset, in disease progression, variability in insulin production and requirement, the debut presentation of the condition. Then the comorbidity is associated and the complications of type 1 diabetes. So you will find in this study that mostly the type 1 diabetes presents before 18 years of age. So almost 40% are less than 18. But as Madam said, right up to the age of 76, you can have type 1 diabetes. Then the disease progression. Again, depending upon the HLA, depending upon the antibodies, the multiplicity of antibodies, the disease progression varies. Look at this. Now, with single antibody, the disease progression is slow, but with multiple antibodies, the disease progression is rapid. Now, again, look at this. This is a, a huge molecular level diagram, but if you look at the infant with type 1 and adolescent onset and the adult onset, you will see the variation. The beta cells, the CD8 cells are multiple, and the apoptosis bar is thick, the survival bar is thin. If you move down, in adolescent, the two are almost equal, and the CD8 cells are decreasing in number, the protective cells, the T-regulatory cells. Again, in adult onset, you will find the beta cells are still surviving, and the apoptotic beta cells are less. So when the beta cells are completely lost, this individual will convert into type 1 diabetes. Now what about the glycemic phenotypes of type 1? Again, the glycemic phenotypes, recently in a paper they have shown there are seven glycemic phenotypes of type 1. Depending upon the socioeconomic levels, the educational levels, the social vulnerability, the education of the family, the environment, the place where the child is brought up. So depending upon all this, there are seven different phenotypes of glycemic variability. Coming to the debut presentation, we know that BKA is the most common presentation. Why? Because we miss the earlier presentations. The child might be complaining of polyuria, polydipsia, and most important, a child suddenly developed enuresis. A child of, say, above five years who had learned the toilet training suddenly starts enuresis. Think of type 1 diabetes. Then, of course, DKA is the most common presentation. Coming to the comorbidities, type 1 is an autoimmune condition, we all know. So there can be rheumatological diseases associated. There can be skin uh, disorders. There can be intestinal. There can be gastric. And the most common we study is the celiac. Then we can have adrenal autoimmune association. 
We can have another most common is thyroid disorders. So thyroid, celiac, and type 1 are the three sisters. They walk hand in hand. Then the conflict, this is another picture of showing this a study which is showing that the association in 20% of the individual with type 1, there was some associated comorbidity, whereas in the normal population, there was only 4% association of the autoimmune diseases existing. And the HbA1c is not a matter here. Coming to the complications and their progression, now just as type 2, Type 1 will also have microvascular complications, macrovascular complications, and even the muscled, which we are forgetting. Even type 1 will develop hepatic disorders also, NASH also, muscled also. Now the progression development is determined by the HLA types and of course the glycemic control. Coming to the endotypes heterogeneity. Now the recent data shows that we have various endotypes, the so six endotypes, Again, depending upon the age of onset, the genetic markers, the number of antibodies present, the C-peptide levels, and the BMI levels. So the type 1 endotype and the type 2 endotype are the type 1 diabetes, and the remaining three have been labeled as LADA. So the endotypes, the type 1 develop below 7 years, type 2 will develop between 7 to 13 years, and then remaining this is the double diabetes where the adults will have both antibody positivity along with insulin resistance. Now look at this. Type 1 endotype will quickly develop diabetes because the insulin is dipping quickly. But in type 2, the presentation will be around adolescent. Again, a LADA and the SPIDDM variant of type 2. Then a coexistent type 2 mechanism. So you can see the uh, drop here, but a plateau here, but finally a sudden drop. And the threshold is higher here. So type 2 also has a component of insulin resistance here along with the antibodies present. So this is the endotype variability again. Why do we need to know this? Again, why? Because we need to intervene. So how do we intervene? We can personalize the treatment by immunomodulation, immune tolerance, replacement therapies. So all these things can be personalized. Coming to the regional and the racial heterogeneity. Now the entire globe is affected with type 1 and India is having a burden of less than 5 per 1 lakh children. So the total burden in terms of numbers, we are having a 9 lakh children with type 1, maybe children, maybe adults, but we have a burden of 9 lakh type 1 diabetes and we are second in the globe. Then the cumulative incidence, again this is a regional and the racial ethnicity variation, you will find the Hispanics overweight develop fast, at the same time Hispanic lean develop last, non-Hispanic are in between. Coming to the mortality and the complications, they also vary according to the region and the race. Socioeconomic heterogeneity. We talked of so many things, but yes, we are still far away. This is not a slide from Indian data. Otherwise, the bars would have been even uh, worse. So people are deprived of pumps and CGMS is still. So this is the population which is least deprived and 43% are on pumps and people are using uh, CGMS also. Treatment heterogeneity. Again, depending upon the learning of the heterogeneity, we think of gene therapy, stem cell-based therapies, immunotherapies, transplants, or we think of basal bolus insulin or even the continuous subcutaneous insulin infusion. This is another way of talking the same thing, that if we know the heterogeneity, if we catch them early, we can intervene in a rightly manner, in a rightful intervention can prevent type 1 diabetes. So to conclude, I have four seconds left, but to conclude, heterogeneity begins right from in utero. So in utero, there is genetic formatting. Child develops autoimmunity. Depending upon the environmental insult, there is progression, and that gives us a variability of age, HLA types, risk genotype promoting in inflammation, multiple autoantibodies, associated comorbid autoimmune conditions, ketoacidosis to present, residual insulin, insulin resistance again, beta cell endoplasmic reticulum stress, beta cell mass is now losing, we have posse hyperimmune CD20 insulinitis, and we have the autoimmune T cell burden. So with this variability, why do we need all this? We need all this because of precision in prevention, precision in therapeutics, precision in diagnosis, precision of monitoring, and precision of diagnosis. So with that, if you want to learn more about type 1, every topic in detail, 
please see us at Jaipur, 7th and 8th of December. Dr. Arshna Sharda, my scientific chair, my vice president, Dr. Bansi, the president of Tie Up Society, my faculties, Dr. Sujoy, Dr. Meena, Mahira, so Abhishek, of course. So please be my guest, be at Jaipur, see me at Jaipur, and I'll be honored to have you once again. Let's not forget, we are dealing with multiple phases of type one. Thank you.